Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Cradle News Roundup, your one-stop shop for all news West Asia. My name is Esteban Carrillo. I am the head of news for the Cradle. As usual, I'm joined by my colleagues, content creator and writer for the Cradle, Karim Shami, and joining us today remotely from London, maybe maybe even 10 Downing Street, editor and columnist for the Cradle, Shermin Narwani. So today we want to just first touch upon quickly on a report from Haaretz, uh, this uh, major Israeli news outlet, who on um, Sunday published further proof that on October 7, Israel, the Israeli army, was responsible for many of the deaths uh, of uh, settlers that day by activating the Hannibal Directive. Now, this is something we have discussed uh, multiple times before in the show. This is something that the cradle was at the forefront of reporting last year, alongside other outlets like the Grayson, like Electronic Intifada. We have been saying this for months, and now we are finally seeing, uh, you know, Western news outlets, because Haaretz, in one way or another, is part of uh, of Western media, uh, report this in English, because also in Hebrew, it was being reported before. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it just seems like an afterthought to many of us because we reported on this so long ago. And uh, um, uh, what this essentially means, for those who don't know what the Hannibal Directive is, is it's a very controversial Israeli military rule that allows the um, occupation army to kill its own soldiers during an abduction if they're being abducted by enemy forces. In this case, of course, you know, as Israeli Apache helicopters were firing from the air and and tanks were shelling from the ground, um, it wasn't apparent to them who was a civilian, an Israeli civilian, and who was a a Hamas fighter, um, and certainly not from the distances at which they were firing upon crowds. Um, One of the things we remember in the early days was that um, the helicopter pilots were confused because I guess the Hamas fighters were given orders not to run because then they could be spotted and identified potentially as an enemy. Um, And so, you know, they sort of slow walked in in scenarios where there were lots of people and there were helicopters in the air. And so at some point, um, the helicopter pilots just, you know, threw away the rule book and fired upon anyone they could see heading towards people and vehicles um, heading towards the border with Gaza. Um, Now, we famously have shots, you know, photographs that Israel uh, published months and months and months ago of what looks like, you know, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of cars, vehicles that had been burnt to a crisp. At the Nova Music Festival. At the, yeah, at the Nova uh, Music Festival. And, uh, well, you know, yes. One assumes that's where the majority were from, but you know they, those cars in the photo were amassed in one place. We don't actually know where all those cars were from. Presumably, now many of them were from um, near the Gaza border crossing that were brought in one to, to one uh, site for the photo opportunity. And so, um, this this suggests that uh, Israel may have been responsible for a very large number of Israeli uh, civilians who were killed on October 7th. Indeed. And uh, just, uh, I don't think we need to go much further with this because at the cradle, you can find all of our previous reporting on this topic. This is something that uh, took none of us by surprise. The one thing I do want to mention about this uh, new Haaretz information is that uh, it it says that a Hannibal directive was issued as as early as 7.18 in the morning. Now, previous Israeli reports, they uh, inferred that the directive was issued at around noon. But now Haaretz is saying it was issued multiple times at 7.18 in the morning, at 7.41 in the morning, at 10.19 in the morning. And then, you know, you have at least three instances of this, of officials uh, ordering troops to just fire on sight. They they turned the Gaza border region into an extermination zone. This is how it was described. So please go on to the cradle, check out all of our reporting on this. And it's still ongoing because Hamas released several statements saying that after they targeted Amir Kava and there was like Israeli soldiers 
uh, going out of the Merkava, Israel airplanes came and bombed the Merkava. So they preferred still to allow to kill their own rather than Hamas taking them uh, as captives. So staying with some of these new reports that are coming out this week, there's a, a letter that was published by the Lancer over the weekend uh, in which three doctors estimate that the Gaza death toll could actually extend well past 100,000 Palestinians, maybe even past half a million Palestinians. They give a very, very uh, conservative estimate of 186 deaths. Now, these are on top of the announced uh, death toll by the Gaza Health Ministry, which at the moment stands above uh, 38,000. But they're saying, given the intensity of the attacks, Given the situation in Gaza, not just because of the violence, you know, the, the military uh, offensive, but also the famine, the lack of drinking water, the spread of disease, lack of hospitals, etc., uh, that we are more than likely to see uh, a surge, a significant surge. And now this, uh, this study by these three uh, doctors, Rasha Khatib, Martin McKee, and Salim Yusuf, uh, <clears throat> estimates these numbers saying if the conflict stops today. But we know that conflict's not going to stop today. I think it's important to note that, you know, the Lancet is a scientific journal and has been notable, for instance, in revealing um, uh, casualties in the Iraq war um, that then became a source of controversy because, of course, some people want that number lower, others want it higher. Um, so, I mean, that's the nature of casualty counts and conflict. Um, but in this case, it points out, you know, the report points out something very significant. It's that, you know, what, where the Gaza Health Ministry was able to, in the early days of the war, uh, calculate the depth and even identify the, the, the dead, uh, that has become near impossible at this point. And the report says that um, as of May 2024, 30% of the then 35,000 deaths were unidentified. So it's becoming impossible. And we've seen the way these bodies are absolutely um, blown to bits, you know, with a head here and arm there. Uh, so it's easy to understand that, uh, that note, note of the, uh, that, that the report makes. But the other thing is that, um, you know, the UN has estimated that by February, of this year, 35% of buildings in the Gaza Strip had been destroyed. And that's that's a larger number today, a much larger number, because that was four months ago. Um, and so that the number of bodies still buried in the rubble is likely to be substantial with estimates of more than 10,000. As you said, Esteban, you know, the, the, the journal says that these are conservative numbers because they say, you know, in cases of similar conflict, indirect death, uh, meaning you haven't been shot or blown up, range from three to 15 times the number of direct deaths. In the case of Gaza, that number is likely to be on the high end because of the starvation policies that Israel has tried to implement, the lack of medical facilities, the fact that they've bombed every single hospital in Gaza and arrested doctors and disappeared doctors. So um, and, and, and sort of lack of access to water and sanitation, um, if you just think that maybe up to 40, 40 percent or more of the buildings have been destroyed in Gaza, imagine what the what, what the outcome of that looks like on the ground in terms of sanitation and um, access to basic services. So it is likely that, you know, in this case, the Lancet estimates four times the number of direct deaths and comes up with that 186,000 deaths number. But, you know, the numbers could be as high as 600,000 or more um, if we're looking at the indirect deaths caused by Israel's war on Gaza. And it matters a lot because we've been talking about this for a while now, the fact that there's so many people still missing under the rubble. You know, like, how do you even recover these bodies? And on top of that, just one uh, a quick thing I want to mention is that we've been hearing also for a while now that uh, that Israel is wiping out entire generations of Palestinians, entire families. So how do you even know who's gone at some point, right? If there's nobody left in the family to say, where's my, well, where's my family? 
then th these people are just disappear, right? They just disappeared into the air, into the into the land, into the land that now Israel wants to just build on top, right? This is kind of the plan now to just resettle. Let's build something, some nice little uh, beachside resorts on top of these mass graves uh, that uh, that sadly Gaza has become. But imagine now, um, last night's bombing of northern Gaza, Gazans are saying was the worst in the war. Um, so there's an escalation of the bombing and, and uh, you know, they did another massacre, the occupation forces of central Gaza, a, a UN school, um, as well as hitting Nusayret camp, which is where that ridiculous... Um, Israeli American operation took place to free four hostages in which they killed three others and massacred um, well over, I think, almost 200 people. Um, so, you know, there have been 43 massacres in Nusayret camp alone since the start of this war in nine months. And then, you know, on top of this, we have these negotiations that seem to be going nowhere because Net Netanyahu and his government don't want to give assurances that will they, that they will um, stop bombing Gaza. He holds on. The Israeli Prime Minister holds on to his his demand that he should be able to uh, militarily re-engage with Gaza at will anytime he feels that negotiations are not going anywhere. Um, so, you know, it looks very much that Israel intends to continue and stretch out their, uh, you know, their bombardment of Gaza and and the the killings of tens of thousands, um, as much if not more than they 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 were in earlier months. Indeed, it doesn't show any sign of slowing down. And you know, to to your point, uh, Sharmin, about the uh, the ceasefire talks, there was this, uh, you know, the way it was portrayed in Western media. I want to just bring up this New York he uh, Times headline that uh, they refer to uh, a demand by Hamas for uh, assurances of a ceasefire in the second stage as a familiar sticking point, right? It's a familiar sticking point that obviously Israel is not going to want to uh, to agree with. But this has been the case now since the since the end of the, you know, the only ceasefire that this war had seen. In November, when we had a two-week ceasefire, since the end of that one, we have just seen Israel time and again uh, not be willing to accept any terms because they don't want a ceasefire. And then they put it, on Hamas, you know, this is always because Hamas is intransigent. It's because Hamas, the Hamas demands are sticking points. It's because everyone in Gaza is Hamas and so on and so forth. And just one last thing I want to bring up is the New York Times also last week reported that uh, Israeli generals, generals in the Israeli army, they do actually want a truce. And it's the government who doesn't want a truce. Hamas's sticking point is it's the most basic thing that every nation pretty much is now asking a cessation of the violence how is that a sticking point that's the ultimate goal but you know israel's israel's uh um intransigence and its um intensification of strikes and bombing and killings in the gaza strip has some huge repercussions i mean abu Obeida, the hamas spokesman last uh yesterday came out and said that not only does is Hamas retaining its capabilities. Um, and as we saw in an earlier podcast, um, continues to manufacture weapons and munitions inside Gaza, like actual production lines. We've seen videos of this now. But it's managed to recruit thousands of new fighters with plenty in the future because people have lost everything. When you, when you, you know, when you have nothing to lose, um, and an enemy is coming at you, you're you're going to fight. Yeah, how do one 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 that because it's your mother and father and your mm -hmm. siblings and you're all alone. So the only choice or the only natural choice is to join the resistance against your occupier. Perhaps this is a good place to segue to what's happening in Lebanon. Israel has conducted a slew of high target um, assassinations of Hezbollah commanders um, and other fighters in, in, in the last months, um, but increasingly, you know, so in the, so I, I think Abu Talib was the most recent Hezbollah commander. He was, he headed up Eastern Galilee operations. The guy has a long record, he, you know, of fighting with Hezbollah. He fought in Bosnia. 
he was killed in June. And then last week, uh, July 3rd, uh, Abu Name, who was commander of the Aziz unit, was killed. And in each of these instances, so the repercussions are absolute, Hezbollah then intensifies its range, depth, or its Israeli target bank. And these are becoming more and more important Israeli bases. In the recent one, um, after, I think, the killing of um, an engineer for Israel, uh, Hezbollah's air defense unit, they um, hit an Israeli reconnaissance spy base, a major one in Mount Hermon. And uh, um, the, the interesting thing is, like, Hezbollah doesn't just, you know, Israel's a small country. There are only so many targets. And uh, Hezbollah is, you know, it can't shoot its wad right at the beginning. So what it does is it hits these things, these bases, um, but not to, you know, uh, destroy them all completely. They're warning shots, okay? The, some of them have been destroyed completely. I think the Mount Meron base has been just like completely put out of commission. Well, the Mount Meron base was hit uh, after they killed the Hamas commander in Beirut months and months ago. But then they continued, you know, every further strike, every warning shot. Again, Maron was hit. Again, Maron was hit. It was hit multiple times. And this is what they are tending to do with bases. I don't I don't recall an entire base going up in flames at the first, you know, um, you know, out of the gate. So what's happening now is each time Israel assassinates a uh, commander in Hezbollah, like a new target is unlocked from Hezbollah and they target a new base or a new location. And the, the recent attack uh, was, was as such. They targeted this base in uh, Syria's occupied Jolan. As well as large uh, 200 projectiles toward, uh, towards this area, including, of course, drones and, uh, and uh, Katyosha missiles. And uh, we have to know that this base, which there's no name for this base, it's very real. And nobody reported the name of the base. It's, uh, uh, it, uh, it sits on the highest point in Israel, uh, where, where, where Israel occupies a part of Syria, which is known as the Jolan, Jolan Heights, uh, and that oversees Lebanon, Syria, and also uh, occupied pa Palestine. So it was a major base, and they, they are saying, uh, saying that it's a source of, of course, for spying. And it also, like, um, uh, you used uh, to process satellite imagery, of course, a side of uh, imagery of Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. So, but also I have, I want to touch upon that uh, Hezbollah is targeting uh, Israeli bases in Syria. Now it's like the new Norman. Uh, I don't know if it has like a uh, future uh, implications. If this expands, if Syria wants to join or uh, this will help Syria. Yeah, really uh, big one, yeah. No, not only to detect the, the Jola is, is, is very early, but I think this reduces uh, the power of Israel to target, uh, mm. to target Syria because they will have less, less intelligence also. And we all know that Syria, of course, helps also the, the resistance, access of resistance by providing uh, weaponry. So this, this one is important also for several reasons, uh, other than it's a reconnaissance spy base. Um, and, you know, as we know, Hezbollah has been trying to take out Israel's eyes and ears incrementally since the beginning of the war, something that has escalated very successfully for Hezbollah uh, in the last few months. Um, but I think what's important about this base, um, other than its location as well, was that it was targeted very shortly after Israel's Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, left the base. Okay, now, if this was Hezbollah's retaliation for an assassination, right, I think Hezbollah showed how close it could get to Israel's most high-value military leaders. That is something worth noting as well. Um, and of course, the fact that Israel said this was the the biggest, um, uh, the largest strike, Hezbollah strike on on uh, Israeli facilities since October 8th. Yeah, but how Israel is assassinating these people, these are like high rank Hezbollah leaders, and they are assassinating them, uh, wherever they are, even if they are in the south or even in Bika. So we, I think we also can touch upon that I think Hezbollah, I don't know if uh, Israelis are spying on them or, or uh, 
they they have a spy a spies inside Israel or uh, well, sorry inside Hezbollah. We know that uh, like the U.S. and the U.K. have been helping them gather intelligence in Lebanon for the past nine months. How Lebanese officials are probably helping them gather intelligence in Lebanon. Let's not forget what happened in in two thousand six. You know, providing maps to the Israeli occupation forces on where to hit in Lebanon. Months have passed by and still the assassinations are being conducted in the same matter. Mm -hmm. So I think also Hezbollah should take more precautions. It's not just precautions, you know, it, the, the resistance axis in general has a policy of establishing deterrence. And they have done so with great deal of success in, in many, many ways uh, militarily but not on the assassinations policy. And for me, at least, it's been, and I think for others, it's been a big hole in their deterrence um, offering, meaning uh, why are you allowing the enemy to take out high-value individuals, either um, strategic-minded people or military commanders, without retaliating in kind? I mean, if you hit um, sort of Israel's equivalents, or the U.S.'s equivalents, let's say in uh, in Iraq and other places, then they would be um, they would hesitate perhaps to assassinate other leaders. You know, this kind of deterrence um, equation has been established in in other military spheres. Why not in this one? But you know, we do hear from people close to Hezbollah that um, in fact they're. Uh, that this is something that has been worked on, whether or not it's going to be a kind for kind um, equation is not clear, though. Let's not forget that when uh, Israel struck Iran's consulate in Damascus, Iran's target was not at all like Western media thought it would be to strike an Israeli consulate in a third country. It was to strike Israel. So the resistance axis and Hezbollah may calculate um, not a kind for kind retaliation for assassinations, but something like this, going for high val value facility targets. I disagree with them because they have the morality not to do so. But at the same time, you're, you're, their enemy is the most immoral entity in history. So that's that's why we don't see that. It's... Sorry, but it's not immoral. It is not immoral or against the rules of law to hit a military target, person, or facility. So it's not an issue of morality at all, in my view. So I I don't know why they're not doing a kind for kind thing and just stop Israel's assassination policy. I mean, what Abu Obeidah said about Hamas being able to recruit thousands and thousands of more and train thousands and thousands of um. Uh, more fighters as a result of Israel's criminal war on Gaza, um, you know, is a testament to how assassinations and killing doesn't work. OK, it, it uh, I think, galvanizes the resolve of um, the enemy more than anything. I, you know, and it's worth pointing out I mean, Israel's assassinations policy is a really dumb short term tactical move meant to like, you know, give leaders there the ability to beat their chests. You know how the Israelis have had like a hot target um, uh, on on uh, Yahya Sinwar as though the war would be over, the problem would be over if Sinwar was killed. It's not at all the case. If you look at the axis and how they maneuver, you know, when, when the Americans killed Ghassan Soleimani, two dozen ballistic missiles hit U.S. bases in Iraq, like nobody had ever done that to the superpower. You know, when, when, when the Israelis and Americans killed Iman Bogniya, Hezbollah expanded its missile capabilities and its armed forces and set up Hezbollah special forces that the Israelis are terrified of facing. All the Hamas leaders killed to date, I mean, dozens and dozens of high-value Hamas leaders, yet you get an October 7th, you know, al assaf led operation. So Israel's assassination policy does not work. Well, I think their whole military approach doesn't work. And this uh, just like uh, quickly brings us back to uh, what I mentioned earlier about the uh, military leadership in Israel wanting a truce in Gaza. And this is exactly because they fear what is going to happen with Hezbollah. They know everything we're saying here is something that is known among the, the leaders of uh, the Israeli army. And this is also why you had uh, the deputy secretary general of uh, Hezbollah, Nan Qasem, a couple of days ago, he said that uh, he told AP, 
that they don't believe that an expanded war on Lebanon is likely in the near future, because this would be, you know, a complete suicide for Israel. Stay with the resistance axis. Last night, uh, the leader of uh, Yemen's uh, ruling al Sarala resistance movement, Abdul Malik al Houthi, gave a very fiery speech in which he took aim at the Saudis after accusing them of colluding with the U.S. and the U.K. to possibly reignite the war against Yemen, this war that has uh, that raged for about eight years and has been dormant for the past year and something changed, right? It, uh, Al-Houthi says that the U.S. sent them, Sana'a, messages saying that they are pushing the Saudi regime to take aggressive steps against us. And then he tells Saudi Arabia to uh, not fall for that trap. You know, he says, do not let the U.S. entangle you. And if you want that, then try it. Right. So uh, there's there's uh, there's uh, several things going on right now between uh, between Sana and Riyadh. Uh, there's been a prisoner exchange talks. There's been a, a lasting uh, ceasefire in general for the past, uh, like I said, oh, a year or, or, or a bit more. But there, there are always these uh, sense that uh, they want to reinflame things, that there's interest there. Remember that uh, Israeli Mossad presence uh, is uh, is there in Yemen. Uh, in Socotra Island, probably in other regions, U.S. troops are on the ground in Yemen as well. So, what can we what can we make of Al Houthi's speech? And do you think Saudi Arabia would make such a poor decision, just like it would be a poor decision for Lebanon for Israel to expand the war in Lebanon? I think it would be an even worse decision for Saudi Arabia to reignite the war against Yemen. Yeah, as you said, it was a very fired up speech. Usually, it's very calm, but yesterday he even used the slurs. Uh, to describe the Saudi leadership. And uh, as you said, yes, he warned them uh, not to c- collaborate with the, the United States against Yemen, especially in these times, because it shows that uh, Saudi Arabia is willing to protect Israel because what uh, what uh, Yemen is doing is like hurting Israel. And now Saudi Arabia wants to reignite the war. Hala, reignite the war still, it's not, uh, it's not clear n- n- now, but what Saudi Arabia did shows that they are taking baby steps to escalate against Assad Allah. First, the people that are coming from Hajj, from Mecca, you know, they didn't allow them uh, at the beginning to go to Sana'a again. To return. Uh, to return. Uh, and what happened is that uh, Yahya Sariya went to Twitter and he said, you have three days. He said only three days. And nobody knew what uh, what he was talking about. Or there were specul- uh, speculations, but of course, for the Arabia knew what he was talking about. And within three days, they released, uh, the, the, they released these people and they returned back. And after they did so, he said, Tam, which means done. And that shows that Saudi Arabia is really afraid from, uh, from Al-Sar Allah. But of course, uh, in, in my view, still Saudi Arabia is like a puppet for, for, uh, for, for the Americans in many ways, especially that what uh, the leader said yesterday, he said that Saudi Arabia asked them to, uh, to move the monetary system from Sana'a to Adan. The banks too, like the, I, I was yeah, the, the banks are the monetary system. So you know that, yeah. So so Adan uh, is uh, uh, is where the uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE's backed uh, militias reside. They reside there and uh, they made their own uh, government. Uh, and Sanaa is where the Al Sanaa government is uh, the true capital of uh, of Yemen. That's one, and the second one. Uh, they, 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 uh, Saudi Arabia halted the uh, the incoming or outgoing uh, airplanes to to Sana to Sana Airport. So they stopped Sana Airport. Previously, Sana Airport was only operating to two states, which are Egypt and and Jordan. Now, uh, Saudi Arabia said, "No, you can't fly anymore," uh, and that's why uh, Abdul Malik Madrin Houthi did this speech, and he warned Saudi Arabia. And he went further. He said that. Our uh, ports versus your ports and our banks for banks, airports for, for airports. And following his speech, of course, the Ansar Allah military media released some uh, footages and the co- coordinates of uh, around the uh, airport and some sensitive locations. Of Saudi Arabia. The, the, the Hezbollah playbook. Yeah, okay. the Hezbollah playbook. So I don't see that Saudi Arabia is going east or in a short time will prefer Russia or China, although many people still see it like this. They didn't join BRICS. I think we have to consider a little bit the bigger picture, which is that the Saudis and Americans are in negotiations over um, a potential defense pact 
um, whereas the U.S. would directly intervene on Saudi Arabia's behalf if Saudi Arabia is attacked. Now, the U.S. really doesn't want to do that, but the U.S. wants from Saudi Arabia normalization with Israel. That negotiation continues, but it's important to note that the two are very much engaged in negotiating some kind of agreement. Um, I think it's also important to note that the Americans and their British allies have been at absolutely unable to even dent Yemen's policy of attacking um, and disabling shipping vessels headed for Israel or connected with Israel. And so the Americans are grasping at straws now, looking to, at least on the surface, um, have the Saudis come in and and uh, you know help them out a bit. Not if this is going to make a bit of difference. I mean, the Saudis fought a eight year war with Yemen and you know are are dying to negotiate a settlement. Um, and the Saudis probably said to the Americans, "Look, we can do this, this, and this, but we're not going to do anything militarily, right?" Um, but just in case they forgot that, Yemen reminded them, and I love the fact that as opposed to the Americans um, and that that pull in the world that, you know, um, is always blustering and chest thumping and threatening. Um, and it's more it's more words than action. Yemen is action and few words. OK, so when 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 uh, Yahya uh, Saria tweeted uh, three days, and everyone and in, went into a panic. What does that mean? Are we are we escalating to a fifth um, stage of the war? Um, you know, w- what does he mean by three days? They showed them okay uh, by releasing, getting instantly within three days. The Saudis released all the Yemeni detainees who had who had been um, detained during the Hajj, and then Sar- Saria says it's been done, and that's all he tweets. Right, so. Very few words, a lot of action. Again, when the Yemenis released satellite pictures of Saudi ports and airports um, during the, uh, you know, after uh, the Saudis started shifting their banking systems and monetary systems from Sana to Aden and shutting down flights at uh, Sana airport, they didn't have to say anything, the Yemenis. They just, you know, published these photos. Like, a picture is worth a thousand words. So is a tweet, apparently. The Yemenis are all action, while the other side don't have a way to stop the Yemenis. So there's a lot of bluster. So just to sum everything you just said, Charmin, I think uh, there's this uh, this piece from the quote from uh, from uh, Abdul Malik al Houthi, in, t- in which he tells Saudi Arabia, "If you get more entangled with the U.S., our escalation will be greater. And do not rely on the Americans; they are failures. This man is not missing words anymore." So let's move on to the results of the Iranian elections. Uh, runoffs were held on the, on Friday, and we saw Masoud Pesesquian win uh, with 53% of the vote. He's now going to take over for uh, the late Ibrahim Raisi as president. Uh, he comes from the, uh, you know, quote-unquote reformist bloc. Uh, we saw a big, uh, a big turnout, actually, right? I think it was more than 50% of Iranians. It was uh, several million came out to vote. Uh, what can we expect, right? What can we expect moving forward? There was a big question, and, and this is not about Peseshkian. It was just a question following the, the untimely death of Ibrahim Raisi of how would the political project that he had undertaken that saw Iran move to the east, that saw Iran join BRICS, that saw Iran join the SEO, that saw Iran take part in the nuclear negotiations with the U.S. for at least two years, and sadly, that went nowhere. So is this going to be a difference? Are we going to continue down the same path? What can we expect? I think there are many things about this election that are worth noting, not just on the foreign policy angle. Um, and I'd like to refer viewers to the article coming out today on the um, the the Iranian election um, by Fereshti de Saderi, who has covered the election process before, during, and after um, for the cradle through this cycle. And um, one of the things is uh, Business Kieran won by almost 3 million votes. 
Um, but his 53.6% share of the votes makes him the second president with the lowest percentage of votes, following fellow reformist Hassan Rouhani, who won in 2013 with just under 51% of the vote. Um, so as clear-cut as things look, um, following the vote counts, it's often the devil is in the details, just as we've seen with the UK elections, where it was a resounding victory for Labour, but they actually did worse than they have in previous elections. So um, that's one thing to note about the Iranian elections. He also had a big boost by he is ethnically um, Azeri and has from his mother's side Kurdish. So he had a big minority vote from Azeris, which I think is the second largest ethnic population after Persians in Iran. Um, and of course, you know, from Kurdish areas and Sunni areas in Iran, he, he had um, the vote. He now has the task of assembling a team of 40 key officials, including ministers, a vice president and deputy president. Um, now, there was a, a big turnout, a larger turnout, right? So in in the the the, the first the first vote, um, which was basically came to a three way race, um, was you know I think about forty percent of Iranians voted uh, eligible voters, and that was not a great turnout. The following Friday, when there were just two candidates, we have around fifty percent of Iranians who turned out. So usually that number goes down in the second vote. In this case, it went up. And so, you know, many people are examining why that happened, et cetera. But, you know, there was a view that uh, Pazishkian is a reformist. Now, I want to mention that Western media leading up to the election called him a reformist. And I noticed a lot of them switching to the term moderate after he won the election. They want to hedge their bets. You know, reformist is good. Cheer on the reformist. And then Let's make him a moderate after because, you know, we might have to deal with an intransigent Iranian president. We might need to call him a hardliner again. We might have to call him, exactly. You know, uh, how can you call them a um, axis of evil if if they're reformists, right? So the language shift was notable to me. Um, the other thing is during the presidential debates, the issue of women and women's rights, you know, Hesesh Gion really milked the um the language of the dissatisfied iranian populace okay um so on the hijab issue and you know just economy issue he just without offering solutions he sort of he just parroted he mirrored their language which is a very smart tactic he had no solution but he mirrored the language one of the things i think voters will now be interested in seeing is whether Pizeshkian, um, who has not mentioned bringing women to his cabinet, will, in fact, offer ministerial posts to women. Now, ironically and interestingly, so-called hardliner Ahmadinejad appointed several women as deputies and even selected a female minister. Rouhani, the reformist, did not appoint a female minister. Raisi did not appoint a female minister, but he ordered his ministers to employ more women in managerial positions in their ministries, which then achieved a target of over 25% of women in high and medium level managerial posts um, in his administration. So let's see what Pazishkian does on that. Um, and I think it's a test, a litmus test for whether he was just mirroring you know, like popular sentiment or intends to actually do anything about it. On the issue of foreign policy, Pizishkion, you know, gave us some negative sentiments on, on uh, you know, a strategic, um, a, a strategic deal with Russia, the Iran's strategic uh, relationship with Russia, um, which slightly mirrored what uh, Javad Zarif had said in a... a uh, a leaked audio tape um, uh, right before Raisi was elected, um, suggesting that the Russians had been um, spoilers in the nuclear talk, which we don't actually know if that's true or not. Um, so there is going to be, I think, some more tension on the Iranian-Russian strategic deal and how that moves forward, if it moves forward. Um, also, because he's talked about, you know, extensively about renegotiating, reopening negotiations with the West on the nuclear deal, the eyes will be on that. However, 
uh, the president of Iran does not control, is not authorized on strategic foreign policy. That is within the realm of the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei. Um, so Pazishkin will not have the authority to initiate talks with the West. He may be given the go ahead if an opportunity arises to to, you know, test those waters. Um, but I think he, like any other president, which is, you know, Rice, he also engaged in negotiations with the West. Let's not forget that. But, you know, those didn't go anywhere because the demands set by the U.S. are just onerous. It's no point. You know, they, they want to renegotiate the 2015 deal as opposed to reestablishing it because Trump left, you know. I remember during these talks, during during the Vienna talks, that the EU did accept the deal that was put on the table, that Iran and the EU did accept the deal. And then it was the U.S. who came in and said, nope. And this was under Biden. This was not even, you know, Trump's fault anymore. Correct. And, you know, if Obama did the deal, it, Biden was his vice president and they were happy with the deal. And then Trump got out and Biden promised to reverse a lot of Trump's um, errors. Right. Uh why then they renegotiate the deal? Just sign on to the very same deal you signed on in 2015. But the U.S. were spoilers in the Vienna talk. And that is likely to worsen. So Pezeshkian, with all his fantasies about, like, rapprochement with the West via a nuclear deal as the vehicle, um, is going to be, you know, uh, sorely disappointed, have basically no maneuverability if Donald Trump is elected U.S. president, right? Um, in the event of Trump's return, um, you're going to witness the reversion to the Rouhani Trump dynamic. Like, there's just no point, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as someone quoted in Fetish's article says, Trump is known for his affinity for strong authoritarian leaders like Putin and Xi. And Pezhashkian's approach tends to, oh, sorry, and Trump's approach tends to favor power and pressure a moderate or reformist um, Iranian president with a conciliatory stance, such as Pazishkian, would likely face increased pressures and demands from the U.S., from a Trump administration for concessions from Iran, which is going to really, really make him look weak if he doesn't stand up and take a much more hardline approach to the, the Americans. Because the Iranians are vastly favorable, poll after poll shows that Iranians support Iran's indigenous peaceful nuclear program. There are no bones about that, you know. Um, so so if Pesheshkian just keeps begging and trying and knocking his head on an immovable object, I, you know, like Trump, then um, he's just going to whittle away any goodwill he got from the Iranian voting public uh, uh, last week. Yes. So, you know, a couple of other big elections took place last week. Uh, the first one, uh, well, of course, Iran. Then there was the UK, the UK elections in which we saw uh, the neighbor party come back to power in the, as you said, Charmin, you know, uh, a majority that ended up being actually uh, the, the lowest kind of possible in the, in the past several years. Um, but then we also had France yesterday in which uh, had a very big turnout of voters in this kind of uh, popular rally against the far right, right? The, the, the first round of this election saw uh, the party led by, uh, uh, by Marine Le Pen uh, come out in front. And now yesterday we saw the French left uh, come forward, uh, among them popular leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who during his speech, he said, uh, we need to recognize Palestine, right? Like one of the first things we need to do is recognize, recognize Palestine. Now this is something obviously uh, meaningful, but at the same time, at this point, with these results, the French parliament is completely hung. It's a hung parliament. Nobody has a majority. Uh, they need to work with each other. Macron is stuck, right? The far right is not like they were completely defeated. They came in third. They still have, you know, like a, a few hundred seats in parliament. The, the, the left, what are they going to do? I, I have no idea. And then, like, you know, I feel like it's a, something, a similar situation in, in Britain, right? Where you have uh, the left in Britain winning. But Starmer, does he even have a pro-Palestine stance? Does he even have, you know, uh, because Gaza has been kind of a flashpoint for all these elections, right? In the West in particular. For uh, France and for, uh, and for the UK, we've seen a lot of rejection for the, for the Zionist perspective or the Zionist, you know, attitudes. 
the dynamic is changing a bit. I'm I'm here in London, sunny London, not so. I I, I want to say that every day this past week we've had three seasons. Every day, <laughs> um, I I'm literally waiting for snow to finish it off. But um, uh, you know, England has been a place where I where where pro Palestine demonstrations go on every single week. These numbers get larger and larger. And one of the things that mainstream media was unable to ignore during this election was that, um, you know, parties and candidates that stood with Gaza, stood on the right side of the Palestine issue, were being ushered into office, you know. And um, so that's that's something for sure that Starmer is not going to be able to ignore, because although it was a resounding win for labor, rather a resounding loss for the conservatives. Let's be honest, people voted anything to get the conservatives out, you know, and labor was the most obvious other party. Um, but, you know, it, Stammer is going to have to shift on his very intransigent, very ugly statements in the lead up to the election where he supported um, Israel's cutting off of water, electricity and utilities to Gaza early on the war. I mean, you know, now, Stammer, um, people sometimes say certain things that will help them get elected. And then there is a different face when they are in office. I don't know if that'll happen with Stammer, but a left leading party winning in the UK, you would imagine would mirror somewhat a left leading party winning in France. OK, so France on day one, the leftists declared, um, you know, recognition of Palestine would be upcoming, right? Is Stammer just going to be the only left-leading party not to support Palestine? I mean, it's going to be a very important foreign policy test for him. Let's not forget that Spain, a major EU country, a major European economy, um, has also come out in support of Palestine, recognized Palestinian state, um, and that Spain has now signed on to support South Africa's um, uh, uh, lawsuit against uh, Israel for, for genocide at the International Court of Justice. So you have these very key now left-leaning European governments, and it's going to be interesting to see what position that places Stalmer in as he tries to move forward with many, many problems in the UK and avoid two massive foreign policy issues that people might expect to see differently than Tories. One is Ukraine and the other is Palestine. I think the, the only thing I would like to add to this is that we always must remember that the Labour Party a few years ago ran out Jeremy Corbyn under accusations of anti-Semitism. Because being critical of Israel is to be an anti-Semite in the West. So expectations need to be always kept in check when we're talking about these parties. You know, it's funny. There was a headline of Israeli paper tweeted today and the headline was like, is God an anti-Semite? When you get to that level of discourse in Israel, you literally, literally cannot take that language any serious, very seriously. And I think in England, too, people realize the difference now very much so between criticizing Israel and criticizing Jews. Previously, like decades ago, what, what happens in the UK or, or France was very important to the region. But nowadays, I think both countries now, they are weaker than, than ever. Mm -hmm. The UK is a follower for the US policy, and the France is, is also weaker than, than ever. So I don't think uh, elections in these countries are now important for the region like, like previously. Now the main players in the, in the region is still uh, the United States, mm -hmm. Iran, access of resistance, and somehow uh, Russia. Yeah. So what I mean, happens in these countries affects the region and what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Europe, I don't think so. Especially that, as Shaimi mentioned, she mentioned that Spain is going to recognize uh, Palestine. But they did already. Yeah. Or, or they, they, they recognized Palestine, but what they really did, I don't know if, if it's intentionally or they don't know or, or whatever the case is. Nowadays, if you recognize Palestine uh, as a state, what you are doing is like giving legitimacy to the PA, which is headed by Mahmoud Abbas, who is a puppet also for the uh, Israeli regime or for Netanyahu or for any one of those uh, Israelis. He's there since 20 years and he f fulfills everything that Israel 
uh, asked had uh, asked him to do, and for instance, his authority killed one of the Palestinian brains, Nizar Banan. If now France or the UK, oh, we love Palestine, we want to regularize Palestine, they are giving power to Mahmoud Abbas, not for the Palestinians who are suffering, especially in Gaza. I feel like in particular with the case with France, remember just quickly uh, that in particular case of France, it, uh, it affects more, I think, Israel. Because remember one of the Israeli ministers last week said that a Le Pen uh, government would be amazing for Israel. So is now a left-leading uh, government not that for Israel? But but actually, that's true. I mean, the the um, Israel lobbies in the States, I mean, there's so much more focus on Republicans now and having Republicans win because Democrats are pulling back. I mean, with the atrocities Israel's committing in Gaza every day, it's becoming harder and harder for these countries, I Israel's allies, to stand behind it. Now, I agree with you, Kenny. Like, it, you know, and I would say the cradle really doesn't cover every, like, utterance from Western politicos on this region because we do find it irrelevant by and large. They may dominate the narrative, but we in West Asia now control the outcomes on the ground, as I've said many, many times before. Um, but in in this case, it's not so much, um, you know, it, it is very hard for European governments to pay lip service to Palestine. Let's just say that from the onset. The fact that they are shows that there's a shift in the political um, ruling class in Europe who are being forced to listen to public opinion, where which they ignore by and large, certainly on foreign policy. So that shift has happened. They've noticed that um, Gaza, for instance, is impacting their electoral wills, uh, wins. Um, and I think what happens more importantly is it gives them to be able to come in and support Palestinian self-determination, Palestinian statehood, means that they can now start to edge away from arming Israel. And that is a, um, a significant shift that would occur, if it does occur, that can change the dynamics of this war and change the dynamics of Israel's um, uh, supremacy in the region. Exactly. That's what I meant, for instance, in law. UK and France, they can't give anything for Israel, for instance. We have in our background information or our thoughts that France and the UK, is very, they are very powerful. But for instance, UK, they talk about this challenger, for instance, the tank, they have only 200. In the whole in France, the whole army of France have 212 uh, tanks, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the, real, the real brain of loss is the United States. I, I think after we see the fact that the UK can do nothing, jack shit against Yemen, against Ansar Allah, and the fact that Macron has been screaming about, we're going to let French missiles be used against Russia in the Ukraine war, like, like the Russians give a shit. You know, seriously, nobody is thinking that a, a French or UK decision or anything is going to fundamentally affect us in the region. But guess what? Not arming Israel is a game changer. And that's the goal. That is the goal. And I think we can leave it there for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Please make sure to leave a like, to subscribe, to uh, follow us on Instagram, on Telegram, and on X. And if you're feeling generous, please go to our Patreon and become a subscriber. For the Cradle News Roundup, my name is Esteban Carrillo. I have been joined by Karim Shami and Charmin Narwani.